Today on Camp Code, we take a trip into the mind of Gabrielle, hearing all about her camp camping season, the many challenges and frustrations she experienced, and the ways in which she pivoted to finish her summer on a positive note. Listen to what she has to say and know that you are not alone. You don't lead camp because you love the office. Ultra Camp has everything you need to manage your program so you can spend more time doing what you love. Manage staff, register campers, take payments, and direct communication all in one place. Welcome to Camp Code, a podcast brought to you by Go Camp Pro. We have seen a lot of changes in our industry over the last 10 years since our podcasting adventure first began. The landscape certainly looks very different as we head into the 2023 camp season. And yet the importance of well thought out staff training remains the same. This season, we delve into new topics, new ideas for skill development, coping strategies, and ways to support our staff to bring their very best. Yes, the what has certainly changed in the last 10 years, but the why remains the same. Join us this season as we talk about, share, and discover fresh and innovative ways to create a purposeful, thoughtful, and intentional leadership training. Welcome to Camp Code, our very first episode of season 10. It is great to be back, and we have an exciting year planned out for you. And as usual, we're going to start by introducing ourselves. So Gabrielle, I'm going to let you go first. Hi, my name is Gabrielle Rela, and my pronouns are she, her. I'm one of the co-camp directors at Camp Oro. And at Camp Oro, we focus on creating a positive environment for girls and gender minorities. And we do that in both in French and English. So if that wasn't hard enough, we do it bilingually. <laughs> Thanks, Gab. Yes. <laughs> I am Beth Allison. I'm co-owner of Camp Hacker and Go Camp Pro. And my pronouns are also she, her. And I'm a camp consultant and trainer coming to you today from Woodstock, Ontario, Canada. And my passion, if you've ever listened to us before, is building solid, supportive, and purposeful communities through intentional and thoughtful leadership training. Now, if you are an avid listener of Camp Code, you may have noticed already that Ruby is not with us. Fret not. She is teaching today and will return for our next episode. So don't worry. We'll have her back soon. As we begin our 10th season, we have spent the summer either experiencing one of our most challenging summers at camp or visiting and hearing more stories than ever about one of the most challenging summers at camp ever. We thought we would begin our year by hearing from a camp director who lived through and thrived through such a summer. And lucky for us, we have one in our midst. Gab is going to share with us a bit about her 2022 adventures. So Gab, first of all, thank you for being willing to sit down and <laughs> reflect upon and share your summer and put it all out there for folks to hear. We hope that through this conversation today, as you listen to Gab's, that you won't feel like you were the only one who had a summer like this and that you may be able to learn from Gab's experiences, the lessons that she gleaned, and even from possibly a few mistakes she might have made, because we all know we celebrate mistakes or mistakes here mm. at Camp Code. So yeah. Gab, let's start with everybody's favorite topic of this year, COVID. How did things go for Camp Waro? This summer. Right. Well, we made not international news only, but national, no, we made international news, national news, provincial news, because we had to shut down um, early our first session. Um, so we had nine staff members who contracted COVID out of, you know, um, out of a, a solid, you know, almost 60 staff members, three CITs. And out of those nine, there was two of them that uh, were our leadership team members as well. And um, I'll say that uh, the day that we had made the decision that we were that we had to close camp, our our two head of drama, um, you know, co-heads were out, of course, because they spent time together. Our archery head, um, our CIT coordinator, our junior section head, um, these are just to name a few. Oh, and so I, I had taught. I remember being in drama, like teaching whatever dance. I wasn't teaching the dance. The kids were telling me what the dance was and I was encouraging. <laughs> and then 
I had to go to archery because there's nobody to take over archery. And I was on the phone with parents, but with like my little Bluetooth and I would be like, mm -hmm, absolutely. And then tap mute and be like, okay, kids, remember, when do we go? And they're like, when you tell us, I was like, that's right. We still have two more arrows to go. So nobody <laughs> crosses the line. And then I'd go back to my uh, Bluetooth and being like, absolutely. And we will be contacting you about blah, blah, blah next. So um, it wasn't safe and it wasn't, it was safe until it just was, we knew it was going to get worse. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so as a whole, our families took it very, very well. Uh, we had very, very positive um, comments and reactions and, 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 and people were very understanding when we told our campers, um, <laughs> I'm trying to, how do I put this? Uh, I role modeled showing my feelings, uh, my, my tears, I role modeled <laughs> that and I role modeled letting somebody else speak for me. Um, yeah. so, um, it was very emotional. I think I was so busy and keeping it all together. And when you're facing, you know, 140 kids and they're all looking back at you and you're trying to tell them they're going to go home tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> it's very difficult. And you're all looking with these really big eyes. And uh, I remember one of them who is a, one of our younger kids looked at me and said, what's wrong, Gab? And I was like, well, I'm feeling a little sad. And you're like, oh, why? I was like, <laughs> oh, and I started crying. It was a whole thing. Um, it was very tough and and our younger ones it, it was okay our oldest ones of course this was really upsetting for them mm -hmm. um and i went to go check on them as they were packing and they're of course all crying and i was, i didn't know what to do or say and i was like do y'all want me to make you like a crying fire like we could just all go sit by a fire and cry <laughs> and they're like yeah gabs that's what we need a crying fire and i was like okay i'm gonna just make you a fire let's go do that so the evening program of that night was um, the play um, that we they still had, you know, five more days that they were supposed to prep for this play. So staff members stepped in <laughs> to play the random roles. The kids had oh. scripts. Um, they were making it up as they go. It was kind of one of those like amazing kids like and they were, of course, our younger section. So it was hilarious. Um, and also, mind you, it's also bilingual. So our there's a yep. French camper that's speaking to an English camper so you can understand <laughs> the chaos. Um, and so I thought telling the kids was going to be one of the hardest things that it was one of the hardest things I had have had to do. It was, but it was, it was important. We had sent out e uh, emails to our families. It was well received and we gave everybody almost like an eight hour time frame to come in and pick up their kids. Um, okay. Of course it was logistically quite a, an impressive feat. We had um, about 15 past uh, 15 alumni that were making as we sent emails out we asked for parents to sign do a mini mini survey to just respond that they understood and give us a time frame of when they could come and if they didn't get back to us within an hour we had alumni phoning them so okay. we were making sure everybody got the information if they had any questions so it was I, I was proud of how that all set up and I was thinking to myself, this is, you know, it's always that famous, like things can't get worse, which I try to train my brain not to do that because it can always get worse. And the next day, that's when the families were coming to pick up. I got a text message from our chef at 6 a.m. in the morning saying, there's a news crew on camp property filming the dining room. Um, so our camp is quite small. It's not a large camp. Um, and if you're by our dining room, you're at the heart, like most camps, you're at the heart of the camp mm -hmm. and there's staff members walking with towels on to go get their showers. Um, I was never one of those staff members, but we all have those staff members. And so I had to, you know, go and see this is felt very invasive and they came onto private property without and asking, they, right? Without asking, there was no permission. Yeah. So we, we ended up having to do, I think there's three three film crews that came or news crews that came to our site that day. Um, we had over 10 interviews um, that were done. So um, we had already called in some reinforcements. So we had uh, one of our camp consultants, Stefan Richard, did most of the interviews that were over the phone. And Jackie did all of the, the that's my, my co-camp director slash 
mother um, <laughs> did the uh, on the 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 video interviews. Um, it was very very unnerving, and um, I bet. it was big news because one of our family members was upset and uh, and contacted um, a, a news team, and you know it it just sort of became a big thing, and I think the reason why it was such a big thing is because I think people really want to just get back to being summer and yes. being normal and typical. Um, and, and the, they even had, you know, doctors talking and saying, this is ridiculous. You know, kids are fine. We shouldn't be closing their programs. And it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's like, well, it has nothing. To, the children were fine there. Nobody was sick. It was, you know, but staff yeah. are truly, truly sick. You know, this is uh, and when you have, you know, 10, practically 10 staff members that are out, plus people that need their days off because they are allowed to have days off, the system isn't built to take care of children um, losing that amount of staff right. members. So especially when you have uh, two leadership team members and another leadership team member that didn't have COVID, but was also quite ill. Um, it's just, we're just, you know, being safe, but uh, the news feed shifted to something quite positive and uh, oh, that good. put us in a positive light as a camp that cared. Um, Cause but, you folks uh, did a lot prior. Like it wasn't like yeah. you just opened up and pretended COVID didn't exist anymore this summer. No. You were very careful and yes. um, proactive, but it happened anyway. Uh, and I yes. know it happened to a lot of other camps out there. Yeah. So what, what's your biggest takeaway from, first of all, just telling your campers and dealing with that before, before we talk about parents or anything like that, what's your biggest mm. takeaway? I think our campers, you know, I th- you know, we, we talk about relationship on this podcast all the time and the why our, our kids are, are very strong within our values. That's why they come back. Um, mm-hmm. They understand safety. They understand wellness. Um, they understand, you know, that stuff sucks and you're allowed to be sad about it, you know? So I think. And I you role modeled uh, that, as you yeah, said. Oh, like yes. They, I, you, in front of every <laughs> proper tears came down my face. Right. And I was like, okay, somebody else needs to talk for me. But you know, it's a, it's, it's a, it was a real, obviously a real feeling. And I think, and I think as a whole, they understood, I think also our kids are not afraid to challenge. I mean, I, I get mm-hmm. quite a few little, like, I shouldn't say little ones. I get a, quite a few campers that will come to me and be like, I do not agree with, and I'm like, <laughs> okay, let's talk about it more. Um, no, I think they just all knew it sucked, you know, and yeah. that it was okay. And it was a perfect storm. The cases that we got were brought in by campers. It wasn't from our staff members, just, just from looking at where, where it um, spread. And it was a perfect storm that it, it hit all three of our separate sections. And so that's right. how so many different people were, were got, got sick. It was, it was, a it was a, yeah, a little bit of a ticky bomb. And, um, no, but I think we shared something also because we, you know, we had such a brilliant night and we had great yeah. food and we had, we, everybody did a proper closing and um, our campers that were there for a month were coming back uh, afterwards, but we had to close camp uh, for seven, for a whole week. Mm-hmm. And so we, um, we ended camp early and then we started our second session later, three days later. Um, and that was necessary so that because there's some peekaboo COVID cases that of course <laughs> that we don't know on our staff um and and, they, and, and of course a lot of our staff were really tired because we were running around uh mostly our leadership team I would say but uh, you know of course our staff were tired but the just the logistics of moving campers uh creating new dining rooms um, yes we had an apartment in St. John that we had foreseen to rent out just in case um, but getting people to there, logistically, all of these things pile up calling families. This is, you know, um, so uh, we were all tired, but it, it's, it created not a, a separate problem. It wasn't a problem, but it was a separate pressure on myself and our leadership team because we essentially were creating a second staff training in what we called reboot camp. Mm. Um, and our staff stayed on site and we did uh, a a 10 to, to 536 um, program for our staff so they could rest. But we had some staff members that were feeling homesick. Um, free time was hard for them. Um, so it's, so we had to not had to, but it was, it, we want to use the time well and look at yes. where we, what we were missing in the first week and sort of 
optimize on learning because of course this was our nobody has ever done this program before the 2022 is a program that we used that was our previous program from 2019 but so except for our leadership team every single camp counselor even if they're campers with us and maybe cits they never were counselors with us in a 2019 or previous program this is our og program so of course there was some there were some little cracks in the foundation that we saw so we we're able to work on that which was really nice but but myself and leadership team were exhausted so having to I run bet. a second uh, staff training was was uh was something that was quite tough but necessary so for those of you listening i just want you to make sure you pick up on a couple of points one they had rented an apartment in the the mm -hmm. village outside from where they were just in case they had to send staff away yeah. talk about thinking things through ahead of time very intentionally um but um also taking that time i mean it was a bit of a disaster for you know a couple of days and then rebounding and taking that time in a positive direction to correct course I want to tell you that I was standing at home listening to the radio, CBC radio, and I heard something about Camp Waro, and of course my head snapped, and I was like, wait, what? And then I heard Jackie's voice, and I was like, okay, mm -hmm. hold on. Um, so it made it sort of everywhere, and then um, also internationally as well. So mm -hmm. are there any takeaways from how you folks dealt with uh, the press, anything you would do differently or any little tips and tricks for something that could happen to anybody next year could be, doesn't have to be COVID related, but where press can show up on site uninvited and unannounced. And what, do you, what did you do that, that you think, yep, that we would do again or that we would do differently? I think, you know, for us, so we have a close relationship with our um, associations and meaning close relationship, we've worked with them a lot. And um, we tried to build that positive relationship. So our Quebec, the Quebec Camp Association was very, very helpful um, in helping to manage that. And we also have somebody, whether you can afford a consultant or not, it's, and I think it's really helpful to have somebody, it could be your best friend, it doesn't matter, but somebody that's not part of your organization per se, that can have an outside perspective and help mm -hmm. navigate what you're gonna do next. Because I'll tell you, my, mama bear killer instinct came out when i saw them filming one of my staff yes. members who was in in her um towel and i'll use the language because it's appropriate to me triggering it was quite triggering it's very very invasive um and uh um extremely infuriating um i think i would have lost it <laughs> yeah i was very close and i yep. knew i was i was livid because i was really quiet and very calm and I was like, uh oh, I'm only like that when I'm really angry. So I, I could clock that in myself. I was like, oh, I was like, oh, this is real gab anger. I was like, okay, you got to keep it together because you can literally, and I'm, I'd only, I only get that way like maybe once or twice in my life, but that was one of the times. Mm -hmm. And I just very politely said, this is not, um, you do not have permission. This is private property. Um, and the woman kept pushing saying, you know, but you are going to speak to us. And I said, absolutely. Once you get off of our property, which is just down the road, um, we'll have a conversation, but you kept pushing, but you guarantee that there's going to be somebody that will speak with us. So I was like, oh, I promise somebody's going to be speaking with you. <laughs> um, so number one, that's, that's, you know, know your rights to obviously remain calm. And three, you do want to speak to the press if they're coming to you because they're going to run a story no matter what. That's when, right. So have, have a role in telling your story which was just in all confidence. And it was matter of fact, and not that it wasn't a big deal, but we talked about it as if it is just business, you know, mm -hmm. camper safety comes first above business and staff members are sick. And so we have to uh, end early and start probably later. And that's that, that's uh, no more, no more, no less, you know, and, mm -hmm. and trying to keep that short. Um, but they, of course, are, they're trying to, some media, I'm not going to say everybody, but there, the other media stations that came in wanted to spin our story as positive, which was very nice. Great. And, That's nice. And, um, but having somebody from the outside, uh, so like our consultant was able, it just so happened he was close by, so he's able to come in, um, our having that relationship with our association, that was wonderful. But, you know, I would make, I, I, I do think camp directors, we do need that support, whether it's, um, 
a consultant, your association, or that best bud that's going to have your back and, and just be a sounding board before mm-hmm. you say anything to the press. And yep. you can say, please wait here. I'll be with you in 15 minutes. And it's somebody that you can call at five in the morning if you need to. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. Well, thanks for sharing that piece. We're going to stop for a break to hear from our amazing sponsor. And when we come back, we're going to be discussing some staffing issues that Gab experienced, including mental health and, of course, anxiety. We'll be right back. You don't lead camp because you love the office. Ultra Camp has everything you need to manage your program so you can spend more time doing what you love. Manage staff, register campers, take payments and direct communication all in one place. Find out more at ultracampmanagement.com slash campcode. We've got something exclusive to Camp Code listeners. You can discover the 10 best marketing tools and tips for camps by visiting ultracampmanagement.com slash campcode and downloading Ultra Camp's free guide, the marketing toolbox. Do you remember why you chose to get into the camping world? Ultra Camp is well aware that it wasn't because you loved paperwork, and that's why they built a platform that streams, streamlines managing each piece of your program all in one place. So no more having to learn and remember several platforms to run your camp. With Ultra Camp, you can register and manage campers, generate and direct communication, organize schedules and activities, and process payments and donations. Ultra Camp's goal is to help their clients spend less time in the office and more time doing what they love. Want to know if Ultra Camp is the right fit for you? They offer free customized demo sessions so you can see their software in action. Sign up at ultracampmanagement.com/campcode. Okay, back to Waro's mm-hmm. 2022 season. Gabs, how did you find everybody's mental health this summer? Was it any different from other years? <laughs> Let, let's put it this way. Uh, there's a, we would typically have, so we have, we have an on-call um, social worker who happens to be somebody that I was a CIT with um, and has, you know, uh, become a quite a, uh, a you know, impressive individual um, career-wise. She's always been an impressive individual. But she's somebody that understands camps extraordinarily well and is very good at her job. And uh, she manages one of the crisis centers in Montreal. So it's somebody that I trust and um, um, and has has been such a support in the past almost, I think she's been with us for eight years as a consultant. And I typically will call her for a summer, maybe once or twice uh, a summer for one or two cases that we have. And that's been our norm, uh, specifically okay. around campers but sometimes maybe staff members and this year um we had seven to ten cases per session so not per wow. not per set not per summer but per session mm-hmm. and I had our that social worker um FaceTime with so new, typically my staff don't meet with her I would take the information talk right. with her and then bring it back to our team or their parents et cetera, et cetera. But because of the amount of mental uh, wellness issues that we had, I would bring in my staff into my cabin because it's a quiet place that has, uh, or it's a private space that has um, internet, put my um, iPad up, call her on FaceTime, and there'd be seven, eight staff members sitting sort of in a line in front of the iPad, and she'd go through each of those camp staff members and talk about those cases with her kids anywhere from self-harm to extreme panic attacks to oh uh, separation anxiety to um detox from uh, from from their tablets which mm. um is is you know it's 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 a, obviously something that we've been dealing with for for a while but i think it's it seems to have increased simply because that's what has been available I, as entertainment right. in the past Yep. couple of years I mean myself mm-hmm. included I have <laughs> realized I became very attached to my phone and I was like oh maybe I need a little bit of a break you know but it's something that that's you know a lot of us I think that have used it as as comfort um yep. and, and communication our, yeah communication and connection and yep yes and and you know I downloaded a really fun car racing game and I got really good at drifting so <laughs> that's a new skill on my resume so you know some things <laughs> We do what we can. So um, it was, it was, it was very, 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 the, 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 
the tension of the cr mental wellness crisis was palpable and okay. us myself calling families and parents to talk to talk to the parents nine times out of ten their parents themselves were just desperate for support and they knew that their child was going through this and they just didn't know what to do okay and it and uh, it was tough. It was very tough. I, I really felt for them. I felt for my staff that were, that this was such a heavy load um, mm -hmm. on their shoulders, even if we were taking on a lot of it, just being exposed and, and feeling that yep. helplessness. So it, it was, um, it's something that we're 100% 100, you know, 100% rethinking how we're creating support at camp, how we're partnering even more with our families. I, I do like partnering with our families. I like building those relationships, but how can we do that in the fall, uh, connecting with them so that we're making sure that, you know, we're just supporting and building that trust relationship. Um, and um, how do we best educate ourselves? But I think more of a su structural support is going to be necessary 100%. And do you think there'll be some more changes to staff training in 23 uh, because yeah. of this? Yes, I, I think that absolutely there's going to be a twist and some, there's going to be a lot of shifts in our staff training. Our staff training already, we realized this summer that we don't have enough time to do the sessions that are necessary that we maybe haven't had in the past. And okay. Um, staff need because kids needs have gotten higher or we're more aware of the needs of children. I mm -hmm. might not always have gotten higher, but we're more aware. Um, but I think also talking about gender inclusion and talking about, um, you know, the cultural appropriation and, and, you know, basically how to create a safer space. I mean, we need to delve into much, many more topics and get people to a base minimum of learning education. So having those sessions on top of the other sessions, such as how to roll your the tent and right. why don't the shutters go down in the cabins, even though it seems logical, you right. don't all close the practical things. Yeah. All the practical stuff. It's it's not feasible to to try to squeeze it all in. And it doesn't leave room for the big feelings or even sometimes the misguided thoughts uh, that maybe some of our staff members are still learning about and we need time to get them to a place of understanding or or us have time to say you're maybe not right for this organization so mm. uh, our our training is, is definitely shifting um for next we've already added on time for our staff training for next year our staff hiring is going to be starting in a in a our application process is going to start in about a week or two. I think, can't quite exactly remember the date, but it's very close around the corner. Maybe I'm in denial. So I'm like a week <laughs> or two, and maybe it's two, but I think it's a week. Um, so yeah, so we've already added in a day as well as we've added in, I think five hours of online training that they have to participate in before they come to camp. Right. Um, and that's something we're going to delve into a little bit more mm -hmm. in an, another episode. Yeah. We're going to talk about hybrid training and how, yeah. how we can get it all done and what's the best way to do that. But yeah. Okay. So mm -hmm. you, we've just focused on some anxiety and mental health stuff, but were there other staffing issues that you had to deal with this summer or was everything else really smooth? No. Well, so our, our year in 2021, 2022, so we have what we call to, as a hiring team, we call the the development team. So this is our, these are past leadership team members or current leadership team members that, um, that are most likely still in university. And instead of them going and get a part-time job at a coffee shop, which is completely fine, we offer them mm -hmm. a job to do hiring and development. So it could be session development, program development, evaluation of camper surveys, et cetera, et cetera. It's a bunch of these little pieces. And we found that this really helps in creating a longevity and a behind the scenes understanding of the business, which helps with really great decision making and et cetera, et cetera. So the dev, our dev team is, is something that I love and um, has always, it's, it's just been such a positive part of our organization. So typically- so our For folks who are team, listening, I'm just gonna interrupt. Mm -hmm. For folks who are listening, how many staff are you talking about? So we have one lead person that runs the, the dev team, and then we have about five or six that okay. are on the dev team, and they're part-time. 
and it really depends on their schedule. So some might work one to two hours a week, others can work up to five or six or seven hours, depending on what, okay. you know, what we've hired them for. So this year, they really couldn't work on many projects because all they did was fight tooth and nail to get staff members up until almost right. a week before camp staff training started. I'm um, sure Wara was the only one. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and so, yes, well, I guess, and I think it's important to say, because we did have enough staff this summer um, for our campers and for, uh, you know, for basically to run camp, we did get rid of our tripping program. Um, we also moved programming into a leadership team responsibility. So we were able to shape, we were able to shave some staff members off with some of the shifts of our programs, but as okay. a whole, we had the team that we needed. Um, Great. That being said, our our kitchen, um, we had amazing staff in our kitchen, but we've had a chef for over 25 years. So to put it in perspective, when I was a 17 year old staff member, that chef was the chef of Camp Waro. Um, I was like a little buble with this with <laughs> with our chef that was uh, that was present. So he really took care of the shopping. Um, he had prep cooks you know, back um, at his other kitchen, he would come in regularly with food and he would cook at, at our kitchen. Um, but like a lot of camp directors, he was he was somebody that has everything, uh, or a lot of old school camp directors, he was somebody that had everything in his head and in his brain. Um, and nobody else knew how to, yep. we knew how to yep. uh, run our dining room, but we didn't know how to do what he did. And so last summer was his last summer. It was just time, you know, just he'd been for a long time. So yes. it was just a natural course. Um, but it was kind of like, you know, you know, you cook the lasagna, then you get it done and then everybody will, <laughs> will be fed. And we knew that that wasn't exactly how to do that. So uh, my, I know how, how to run our kitchen, but not, not in the way that a chef can. So we did hire somebody from the outside. Um, her values matched our values. We we're very, very excited about her. As a whole, this person was quite uh, lovely and could make um, food taste amazing, but you know, struggled with organization and maybe sometimes leadership. Um, nothing, nothing on her, but we didn't have a structure for her to fall into, and so it. it this is a you know a shared responsibility. Um, and so we did develop an organizational structure and we did develop a leadership structure, but it still wasn't a match. So, um, you know, both parted ways uh, very amicably. Um, our sous chef became our chef to do lunches and dinners. And our my co-executive director, Jackie Rail, was in charge of breakfast because that was the only way that we could make sure that our sous chef wasn't going to completely burn out um, as somebody that's, you know, learning the ropes. And she's a, our, our sous chef who became a chef as a nutritionist, uh, has worked at Waro before. Our kitchen manager has been with us for many, many years, which we very much needed because even though we had COVID in the first session, like a lot of camps, we had COVID throughout the summer, just not as intensely in the first session. Right. And um, we put in a couple of different protocols throughout the summer, such as mandatory PCR tests, masks for five days, um, et cetera, et cetera. That did help, really helps uh, slow COVID down within our organization. We still had to create multiple din dining rooms as that would be followed with different dietary needs, et cetera. So really became that team. Um, but I had to put a lot of energy and effort into helping develop that while we were managing COVID, while we were managing mental wellness and a, a team, a kitchen team that cared so much about our, our staff and our campers eating well. Um, so their anxiety of making sure they were doing a good job and their mental wellness, um, because yep. there was a lot of pressure on them because they cared so much. So it's, uh, right. it, it took, it took a, an insane amount of energy. Anybody that's a camp director knows when you have a tough kitchen summer, it's just a tough summer. It's, there's no way around it. Um, so that was, that was definitely another, another piece and, you know, and, and everybody that worked in the kitchen beside us, our sous chef and our, um, and our kitchen manager, uh, we, most of the people weren't skilled, weren't, didn't have experience. We actually did have another prep cook that was quite experienced and she was wonderful. They're all wonderful, but big learning curve. So we did bring in 
past leadership team members um, to fill in and to help out uh, and to manage. Um, we had a, a staff member, uh, an alumni that took her two days off that she had from her that she has from her previous job, and she would come up for two days and just work in the kitchen. Uh, and pitched a tent behind my cabin because she couldn't sleep in a cabin because of COVID. Um, and so, yeah, that sort of external help was necessary for us to, to make it to the end of the summer. And great that you have already built up those connections. You have such a strong alumni group and work so hard to build that, that there was just the, those people were ready to pitch in and help out and pitch a tent as well. So well, yes, and we we foresaw we foresaw that we were going to need help this summer. So we had reached out to past alumni um, to come in and support us. Uh, typically, we have um, somebody, well, Natasha and Sophie, who are two teachers who love keeping those teachers around. Um, they can't come at the beginning, but we typically have them come at the beginning of the second session to meet with staff, meet with leadership team, and they really come as a support and. And they help shift the boat in the direction that needs to be shifted. But this summer, we had 10 past leadership team members that came back from anywhere from five days to three weeks. So not somebody that came for a day, literally five days to three weeks. And I'll say that we wouldn't have been able to run our summer if we didn't have this extra support um, because the our two leadership team members that were out in the first session, well, we had another one that was out in the second session, and we had two others right. that were out in the third session. And with the mental wellness um, cases that we had, as well as our kitchen. Um, so it's, did we did we finish the summer successfully? Yes. Was it a successful um, summer? Not really in the sense that it would have never been successful without these extra added little pieces that we, or flotation devices that we had to add on to it. And so that's where a lot of the going back to the drawing board, um, that's a lot of what what I'm doing right now in September and taking naps. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I think you've earned those. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but I just hope people are really hearing how, um, I use the word so many times, but intentional you were even before the summer started, anticipating possible needs and setting some stuff up that way with alumni in this kind of situation, just so that you weren't scrambling last minute to find people, you knew there were people coming up to help out, even though you didn't know how many people were going to get COVID or what was mm -hmm. going to happen this summer. And I think that's a valuable lesson for every year for people mm -hmm. to kind of think about and have alumni on call, so to speak, yeah. or also who are going to come up and just, you know, hang out and do cool things um, or really get put to work depending on what camp needs at that time. So yes, and we have we have a fairly strict policy that we don't have alumni come and help out on camp, uh, except for arrival day and departure day. But we do have past leadership team alumni come yeah. because they tend to be able to understand what needs to happen behind the scenes. Right. And they're not there for the glory of uh or the the memory, the nostalgia. Yeah. yeah. Um, right. I want to just hop in a canoe. Like I don't, we don't have time for that. Um <laughs> And, and I think the last three years, it, what one thing that I think a lot of us have learned is we don't know what the heck is down the road. Like, that's what I just, I realized that. And I was like, we don't, I don't know what's going to happen. Um, none of us. And we can have seven different contingency plans, which is basically what we've had for the past three years, which mm -hmm. I call the dreadful seven, because I hate <laughs> planning for stuff that I don't know what's going to happen. But you're like, here's yep. seven. And then we would have another seven contingency for program and another seven for dining room and another seven mm. for waterfront. It's just the dreadful seven and try to have a contingency plan for all of them. And most of the time, you're not using any of those contingency plans. It's right. very, very, <laughs> it's very struggling, uh, <laughs> frustrating. Um, but yes, like trying to surround yourself. And and that goes back again to the, the dev team where you're if, you're, if you're able to put in your budget to have a handful of staff members just work small part-time hours, they really start to have that, you get to build that relationship with mm -hmm. them throughout the year. And so, you know, they came up when they could and I feel very grateful uh, for that support. Wow. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story. You have earned a rest, which I understand you haven't been able to take yet. So I'm hoping it's soon for you. 
Thank you. Um, I'm just tired listening to you. So, um. <laughs> <laughs> all it right. Was the, it was the most, I, I will say, first of all, I love being busy. I love hard work. Um, my brain craves it. Like I just, mm -hmm. ooh, and adrenaline. Oh, my brain loves that stuff. Um, this summer, uh, this was the summer I was the, I worked the hardest by far. And so I'm naturally drawn to keep going, keep moving. Mm -hmm. It's exciting for me. Um, not all year round. It's not sustainable, but I like it, you know, during the summer, yep. but this summer was just, it was too much. <laughs> so it's just ridiculous. And I think that, um, the, the last three summers, if we really look at it for so many camp directors, it's so much unknown constantly. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, um, yes, we all need to take that break and we all need to take that, that pause and reassess. But, um, I think this is the first summer out of the past three, one, this was the hardest, but two, I do feel though, now I have an understanding of what I can plan for, for next year. And I don't need to go to the dreadful seven. I actually maybe can go to like a happy three uh, <laughs> contingency plans. I'm going to like very, very happy for that. And, and grateful for that, that I think that, you know, I my you know, next year we'll see what, what that podcast looks like <laughs> and maybe I'll be eating my words, but, um, but I feel for the first time that I have an understanding a little bit more on where the support is. I'll, I'll tell you mental wellness is the top of where I'm the most confused and the most, uh, concerned about high concerned I actually was looking up going back to school um so do I need to become a therapist is that's what's going to be helpful but um I think partnerships is where it's at for us and and trying to figure that out but at least there's a platform to jump from whereas 2020 and 2021 I didn't feel like we had such a platform right and we'll dive into more of these kinds of theories ideas all of that stuff over the course of our season so as we wrap up our first episode of season 10, we will not ask Gab for her, her famous recap since she did all the talking today. So you can look forward to that in our next episode when Ruby's back. Here's how you can get involved with Camp Code. You can tell us our thoughts on this episode or any other by using the hashtag Camp Code. And you can also tell us any topics you'd like us to discuss, guests you'd recommend that we have on the show. We've got a few lined up for this year that we're super excited about. Any great leadership training tips that you have to share, we would love to hear from you. As we say all the time, we're all about sharing in this industry. And if you found our podcast useful, we would love it if you left us a review in your podcasting app. Your feedback helps us keep the show going. And if you'd like to contact either of us individually, this is how you do it. So Gab, how can they find you? Um, they can email me at info at .com, or you can um, follow me on Instagram at gabrielle.rail and rail takes two L's. Thank you. Our website is gocamp.pro. You can email me directly at beth at gocamp.pro and I am on Twitter at Topaz. For our next podcast, Ruby will be back. And we will be discussing, after reflecting on everybody's summer challenges, how we start to plan for what's next. Our final segment on each podcast has always been a best practice for leadership training, and we saw no reason to change it for season 10. And again, we would love to hear some of your memorable moments or your most effective tips, and you can tell us what they are using that hashtag camp code. And this week, our best practice comes from Gabs. Oh, thank you. Um, I'd like to share a little story um, about a camper. So this summer I had, um, you know, you're, de we're, you're dealing with so many things and I was kind of desperate to deal with the, the typical um, things that happen at camp that a camp director needs to step in for. And um, this poor camper who was nine years old, um, we were doing our COVID tests and she didn't want to get her COVID test. It just sort of sent her over the edge. And so I got a walkie talkie saying, you know, this camper, we'll call her Sarah, um, is having a meltdown, basically, can you come? And I was like, oh yeah, you know, this is, so I went and she, <laughs> so when I, when I found her, she's just, you know, doing that, like, ah, I don't want to be here anymore. And she was doing like the foot stomping and it was quite pleasurable uh, to see. And, uh, you know, I like that type of passion. And so I was like, oh, Sarah, like, can I help you out? And she's like, no, you have to stay away from me. And I was like, okay, like, I was like, is this too far? Like, is this a good distance? And 
I don't care. And she lives in the States. Now we're in the middle of the mountains of Quebec. And she said, I'm going to pack my stuff up and I'm going to push my trunk all the way to, you know, whatever <laughs> state she lives in. So I was like, look at this determined her determination. I was, <laughs> ugh, I loved it. So I walked into this cabin. It's during our rest hour. And um, so there's the three other kids. And uh, so uh, Sarah's packing, you know, her trunk and she's just, ah, and I don't want to be here. And she's slamming stuff into the tr- into her trunk. And the kids are like, Gabs, what are we doing this afternoon? Because like, if it rains, do we still do kayaking? Like totally oblivious to this one <laughs> kid that's, you know, throwing her stuff in. And one of our French campers asks me like, you know, so she sort of clues in and she says, she's like, wait a minute, is she, is she going home? And I said, well, she's having some really big feelings right now. And the other camper says, oh, my, my mom says my brother has big feelings too. You know? <laughs> so it's like, so you're getting, so I'm sitting in here. There's one kid that's packing up her stuff. There's like three others that are, you know, surrounding me with random questions. And it was kind of the only break I had. I don't know in how many days I just, I hadn't sat for I just hadn't mm-hmm. sat and I just just being surrounded by the the you know asking questions and the randomness and this one kid and her big feelings and um it was actually quite lovely and so the the kid uh, ch- tried to push her trunk out the door and I I asked her before she got it down the stairs what might happen to the trunk and she said and then she got all upset she went ah everything's gonna fall out and I was like yeah and I was like I was like I'm just gonna put it out there at the risk of you getting upset but maybe you think you need a nap and she got very upset about that and then I said well you know <laughs> says the kid that doesn't need a nap she got really pretty upset about it and so so then and then she took a deep breath and I said yeah I think a nap would be great and I was like oh that's awesome Sarah so I'm trying to think where do I bring her like the health center because we're not keeping anybody in the health center because right. if you're sick you're going home and so as we're walking to the health center, I get a walkie from our healthcare professional. And she says, you know, Haley to Gabs, can you come and meet me at the health center? <laughs> Which means that's mm-hmm. that means there's somebody that has COVID. So now I have this kid and I'm like, she needs to take a nap. Where do I put her? So I, the only other place is my cabin, which I have a couch on the couch in my living room that directly links to, if you open the door, you can see outside. So I tell this kid, Sarah, you're comfortable with sleeping on this couch. We, I open the door. She's like, wow, this is beautiful. I said, yeah, we're going to have to leave the door open. I'm not going to be in the cabin, but are you okay with that? She pulls out from, I don't know where her sleep mask. She's like, it's no problem. I have a sleep mask. And I'm like, okay, (laughs) classic. She passes out on the couch and I go to the, to the health center. (laughs) And then we deal with all the sort of stupid COVID crap that we have to deal with and then call the parents and the other parents and it's all a logistical nightmare every time somebody has COVID it's just like a yep. you know takes time and all this kind of stuff anyways it was a beautiful moment I I didn't forget about Sarah on the couch but she did sleep there for an hour and 45 minutes and then I quickly remembered ah I have a camper on my couch <laughs> uh, went with her counselor her counselor woke her up she went to her activities everything was fine she felt much better I think that my tip of the week is if you can start now building um, relationships with people that can support you. Our, our healthcare professional Haley was absolutely amazing this year um, herself. And then these, these other uh, returning leadership team members were amazing. My current leadership team members were amazing. I don't know exactly what what's going to happen next year. I don't know what your mental wellness might be like next year, uh, your physical wellness, uh, your physical wellness, what that might be. Um, but we need people around us. And when I was sitting there and I was thinking, oh, I haven't sat in how many days? That's not, it wasn't me that's like, Gab, you should be, you should have taken more rest. I didn't have a choice. There was no choice right. in, in, in me not sitting. Um, but what got me through the summer was that I had these people to rely on bit by bit here and there, you know, um, just from the fact that my healthcare professional knows not to say something over the walkie talkie, that's somebody that has my back. And if you can, try to plan ahead and to get some of those people to support you. Um, even if you don't have anybody, talk to one person saying, how do we find people to support us? Um, that's what helped me make it through the summer. And it's what's helped me right now um, be able to reflect on next year. Because if I didn't have that support this summer, uh, I wouldn't be reflecting on next year. I don't, I, I don't think I would, I think I'd be, maybe I, I might probably would have had to take some time off 
for a larger period of time, I think it might have been burnt out. Um, so if, if that's possible, if you're able to do that, try to do that now and plan that now. Put that, make that your priority. That's great. Thank you for listening to my Sarah story because it's <laughs> She's like one of my favorites. <laughs> it's a great story. And thanks for sharing all of that today, Gab. We're really <laughs> grateful for you being vulnerable and sharing what happened and letting us pick your brain and, and learn from you as well. Thanks. That's it for today, everybody. Camp Code is part of the Go Camp Pro uh, podcast network, and you can check out all our other podcasts at gocamp.pro slash podcasts. There are seven podcasts in all, seven different types of podcasts, each with a different focus to help as many camp folks as we can. So give them a listen. And from all of us here at Camp Code, thanks for the listening, friends. Mm -hmm.